Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's glad to see, I'm glad to see everyone here. Uh, if nothing else, you're staying out of the Washington heat today and the air conditioning and enjoying a lunch. My name is John Mayo. I am a professor of economics, business, and public policy at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, and I am also the executive director of our host institution for today, the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, I will tell you that we are delighted today to have uh, a discussion on something very important, near and dear to the Georgetown Center, and that is the subject of trade policy. And in particular, we are going to examine the issue of whether trade remedies, think tariffs, quotas, and the like, remedy, act to remedy unfair trade practices, or are they themselves simply protectionist policies? Uh, today's panel is going to be moderated by my colleague, Bob Vastine. Bob is a senior industry fellow at the center. Uh, he has taken a wonderful lead in promoting and advancing the Georgetown on the Hill series that has clearly gotten so popular over the years. Uh, we're, again, I'll say we're glad to have you here. Uh, I won't steal Bob's thunder, but I will simply, in terms of introducing the panelists, I will simply say that is an extraordinary blue ribbon group of people that will be talking today. I will also say that when we looked at the list of registrants for today, uh, we saw a number of experts in the audience, and so we wanted to make sure to have ample time for questions and answers. Uh, in that regard, let me tell you that we'd love to hear from you, so I'll be forming your questions as you hear the panelists speak. But when it's time for Q&A, please do the following. Please simply raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you. This is an event that is being recorded for posterity's sake and being broadcast live, so it's really a nice idea to be able to, number one, identify yourself and to be able to identify your organization. So with that, let me turn it over to Bob Vastine, who will in turn introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And thanks, everyone, for being here. It's a great group. Uh, we're riding a dramatic wave of change in U.S. trade policy. Some think this bodes well, others that think that it will rip the fabric of our legal and business relationships with countries that are deemed to be taking advantage of the U.S., such as in treaties like the NAFTA. For a thorough exposition of this point of view, I call your attention to an editorial in today's Wall Street Journal. At the core of this controversy is the role of trade remedies. These are provisions in U.S. law that allow the U.S. to remedy foreign trade practices like dumping or that may threaten the nation's security. These provisions have been enacted by Congress over decades. While they are an accepted pillar of U.S. trade policy, many believe that at the end of the day, they do not benefit the U.S. economy. And so they have always continued, contained provisions that allow the executive, the president, to provide a restraint by tempering their reach and their, the impact of these remedies, so-called remedies, in the national interest. Now we are in a position where the president seems not to be interested in restraint. I quote his remarks to a business group on Monday. Quote, for decades, Washington has allowed other nations to wipe out millions of American jobs through unfair trade practices. Wait until you see what's up for you. So today we have a panel representing sharply different viewpoints. I'd like to begin by introducing briefly the members of the panel, is, uh, uh, starting on my right. I think it's my right. And uh, the first is Chad Bowne, who is a, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics as a senior fellow. By the way, th these uh, bios are explicated more completely in your handout. He served previously as senior economist for international trade and investment at the White House on the Council of Economic Advisors, and most recently as a lead economist at the World Bank. Steve Clays is a partner at Wiley Ryan LLP and former trade counsel to the House Ways and Means Committee, Subcommittee on Trade, where I'm glad to say that I've been able to work with him over a number of years. He's now at Wiley Ryan, a uh, law firm assisting international trade law and policy clients. Um, next is uh, Tom Sneeringer, who um, 
who is the president of the Committee to Support U.S. Trade Laws, the CSUSTL. He asked me not to try to pronounce that. An organization of manufacturers, workers, and others that are dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of U.S. trade laws. He has been eng heavily engaged in particularly a U.S. steel policy for a number of years. <coughs> um, next we have Bill Reinch, uh, a distinguished fellow with the Stimson Center, where he works principally with the Center's trade policy initiative. He served for a long time, very predominantly, prominently, as president of the National Foreign Trade Council, and uh, he was an assistant secretary of commerce. Uh, I'm also glad to say that I've known him for a long time. We both worked for very distinguished senators. He for uh, Senator John Hines of Pennsylvania, and I for Senator John Chafee of Rhode Island. And finally, we have uh, uh, um, Nelson Cunningham, I'm very confused here by the paper, is president and co-founder of McLarty Associates, uh, a prominent international strategic advisory firm. Uh, prior to that, he served in the White House as special advisor to President Clinton on Western Hemisphere Affairs and as general counsel at the White House Office of Administration. Nelson has a, a very wide and very well-established reputation uh, in this field, and we're very glad to have him and the others uh, here with us today. So we'll start with opening remarks from each. Uh, to five to seven minutes, however uh, long it may take. And uh, when that's completed, we'll turn to the audience for questions. And again, thank you all for being here. So at this moment, I'll turn to Mr. Brown. Thank you, Chad. And by the way, can I remind you all speakers to punch your button here. The green, the le the green light will then come on, and that's essential. And as, as John said, we're all, this is all being televised live. So thanks, Bob and, and Georgetown, for the opportunity to be here uh, and to share uh, the stage with the panel. Uh, so my name is Chad Bown. I'm a senior fellow with the Peterson Institute. Uh, and my life and research is essentially on this topic of trade remedies. So the first question we should ask are, what are trade remedies? And so historically, trade remedies, we think of them as being things like anti-dumping, countervailing duties, and something called a global safeguard. So anti-dumping is a policy, an import-restricting policy that uh, governments use to deal with unfair trade, uh, low-priced imports. Countervailing duties are unfair trade that's subsidized imports, subsidized by foreign governments. And a global safeguard is nothing unfair, necessarily. It's just there's a, a lot of imports, a surge in imports. Uh, and these are policies that the United States has used for decades. Uh, and policies that governments around the world use as well. And there's special rules that allow governments to use these under our international trade agreements, in particular the, the World Trade Organization, and before that, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Uh, but in some sense, this is nothing really new. Uh, what I have done for my last 15 or so years of my career is to study these things. I have built a database called the Temporary Trade Barriers Database. That's a public database that's out there that folks can look into these things if you want. What I thought I would do in my time is to uh, describe what it is that we're seeing in the data uh, and what we think this might mean for the United States, the global economy, especially in light of changes that are happening right now under the Trump administration. So uh, even before the Trump administration came into effect, uh, you know, countries use anti-dumping, countervailing duties especially, and the United States is, is no different. It's one of the world's most frequent users of these types of policies. Uh, over the last couple of years, the United States has started to use these to restrict slightly more imports than normal, but nothing really outside of the ordinary. The United States hasn't used them all that much, uh, with, with one exception. And the exception is to deal with imports from China. Uh, so the main target of the United States' use of both anti-dumping and also countervailing duties since China's accession into the WTO in 2001, uh, it, it's basically been China. So really, for the United States, these trade remedy, trade remedy policies have been kind of an anti China policy to deal with imports coming in from China. And even though China's export growth has been tremendous, um, you know, and by my estimates, as of the end of 2016, about 9% of US imports from China are being dealt with through these types of policies, through anti-dumping countervailing duties. So these claims by the Trump administration that, that no previous administrations had ever done anything about imports from China is just patently untrue. Uh, you know, dating back to the Bush administration, certainly under the Obama administration, these policies have been used to slow down imports from China. Now, 
there are current problems uh, in the global economy that we can attribute some of them to China. So we can talk about the, the overcapacity problem in steel, uh, the overcapacity problem in aluminum. Uh, but these are really also just kind of symptoms of, of deeper problems, which are that China is fundamentally a different type of economy than the United States, Western Europe, Japan, Korea, market-oriented economies. When China came into the WTO in 2001, there was an expectation that China might become more like us, more market-oriented, but it hasn't happened automatically. Uh, and so we are at a critical juncture today, 15, 16 years after China's entry into the WTO, about what to do about the fact that China hasn't become a market economy and are the rules of the, the trading system that we have right now adequate to deal with that, right? Those problems would have been there regardless of who won the 2016 election uh, and whether or not we had these issues of, of steel and, and aluminum overcapacity. Now, as I mentioned, uh, other administrations have used anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Uh, the Trump administration, when they came into office, has chosen to do things a little bit differently. They, of course, are also using anti-dumping and countervailing duties, um, but they have, in their use of these sorts of import restricting policies, escalated a lot of the political rhetoric. Many of you probably haven't heard of trade remedies before the Trump administration, and that's because they typically fly under the radar. They're not something uh, that, that, that generate a lot of political attempt, attention. Uh, the Trump administration has changed that in a number of different instances, but most recently it was with respect to cases against Canada and Mexico on topics like softwood lumber uh, and, and sugar. Uh, the, the political escalation to the to the level of the Secretary of Commerce even, let alone the President, is rather unprecedented, uh, and then raises the issue of foreign leaders also having to get involved in these types of issues and then becoming less technocratic. So that's one big distinction with this administration. The second, obviously, is they have pushed beyond using the more traditional trade remedies of anti-dumping countervailing duties that are well known, well understood, and used by countries around the world, not just the United States, pushing into use of laws that we really haven't utilized. Uh, and what I have in mind here are these Section 232 investigations, the, the national security, the threat that steel imports or aluminum imports are somehow a threat to the United States' national security, uh, and the investigations currently under, ongoing uh, uh, under the Section 232 law. You know, the last time we saw one of these investigations was back in 2001. It's been a really rarely used law, uh, and it provides tremendous discretion uh, for the president to, to, to invoke uh, you know, a, a sweeping sets of, of trade barriers if, if he were to so choose. Uh, and so that's, you know, we can come back to this discussion about whether we think that there is a national security argument um, for stopping imports of, of steel or aluminum. I'm not of the view that there is. Uh, and the main reason that I would argue for that is most of the steel and aluminum that we currently import into the United States is not from our quote unquote military adversaries. Um, because of policies like anti-dumping and countervailing duties, in fact, we've already halted much of the steel and aluminum that we might import from China from coming in. Most of our steel and aluminum that we import comes from Canada. Uh, steel also comes from Mexico, Germany, Japan. Uh, these, to my mind, are not military adversaries. At least historically, they have been allies of the United States and not a threat to the United States' national security. Other initiatives of the Trump administration uh, in the realm of trade remedies in these Section 232 cases was the government self-initiated the cases. Typically, that's not done. Uh, it has happened before, but it's extraordinarily rare. Typically, it is companies or labor unions that come forward and, and file these cases. But by the Trump administration self-initiating the cases, bringing them forward themselves, they have essentially changed the playing field and said to business, we are open for protection. We are open for trade barriers if you want it. Uh, and in my mind, that has then led to the next outcome, which is we've also seen use of or initiation of cases under the third trade law, this Section 201, the Global Safeguard Law. And here we've got two new cases, one on solar panels, one on washing machines. The last Section 201 case that we saw was also back in 2001 on steel, 
much like today. Back then, we had an overcapacity problem in, in the steel industry. Uh, the George W. Bush administration utilized the Section 201 law to deal with that, uh, the import surge that was coming in globally imposed a set of import restrictions, but it was managed. It was done through normal channels. Uh, it did not escalate out of control, and it's very different from what we're potentially seeing today. The last point that I wanted to make about uh, trade remedies in order to set the table to highlight, again, just how important they are in the, in the contemporary discussion is what happened this week when the U.S. Trade Representative released their negotiating objectives for the NAFTA. Uh, the new NAFTA that the Trump administration is going to negotiate with Canada and Mexico. On page 14 of that set of negotiating objectives, there is a subsection called trade remedies, and they had two main proposals. One is to eliminate something called Chapter 19, which is a special dispute settlement forum in which any of the NAFTA countries can challenge or investigate uh, anti-dumping, countervailing duty, import restrictions that get imposed on essentially their exporters. And this has kind of served as an extra check balance to make sure that the, the abuse of those sorts of remedies doesn't happen. And the second was to um, potentially end a current provision of NAFTA, which is to say when countries impose a global safeguard under the Section 201 law in the United States, uh, that they generally end up exempting other NAFTA countries. So if we think back to the Bush administration of 2001, 2002, the steel safeguard import restrictions, it was a 30% import tariff that was imposed on countries around the world with the exception of our free trade agreement partners, with the exception of imports coming in from Canada and Mexico. Uh, and so the Trump administration would like to remove these elements, which to my mind are a negative signal in that it really suggest that what are their main interests are making it easier to reimpose trade barriers against uh, Canada and Mexico in particular and potentially hurt trade in the, the North American region and hurting potential supply chain activity in the North American region. And so with that, I will, I will stop. Uh, that hopefully sets the stage for um, some of what we're seeing out there. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Chad. That's very good. <coughs> Steve, do you want to pick it up? I'm sorry. Let's go. I'm sorry, Tom. Okay. Please. All right. Thank you, and I'm very pleased to be here under the auspices of my two favorite institutions, Georgetown University and the House of Representatives, so very good years in both places. Uh, I'm going to make uh, three rather pedestrian points, but I think it'll help us uh, keep everything in context for the later conversation. Uh, the first point is that uh, everybody's for rules-based trade, but we reserve the right to pick the rules that we like and we don't like. Uh, the, the, in the case of the uh, remedy rules, and I'm going to speak exclusively of anti-dumping and countervailing duty, ADCVD, uh, there is a dividing line, and it's really defined by how you answer the following question. Do train re remedies f distort free trade, or do they protect and enable free trade? Now, that's, uh, that divide has created a lot of... Um, a lot of sharp opinions on one side and the other. For example, if you believe trade remedies distort free trade, then the other side consists of lazy, incompetent throwbacks, unable to cut it in the global economy, unwilling to try, and selfishly driving up costs for everybody else. If you believe remedies enable free trade, then the other side consists of naive ideologues who would probably vote to repeal the anti-smuggling laws and would take receiving stolen property out of the criminal code. Very few people have been known to cross that line. I will say this, the 232s, if nothing else, has certainly uh, calmed down a lot of the anti-ADCVD language. And in fact, right now for the first time in 15 or 16 years, I've actually heard something favorable said about the steel 201. Uh, but a number of organizations that have weighed in against the 232 have spoken uh, favorably of the ADCVE laws. Just quoting one, this is from a group not known to be advocates of ADCVD. These laws have well-established procedural requirements for determining injury and assessing the appropriate scope and level of remedies. That's progress, in my opinion. Now, the only people who have actually changed their mind on this subject or crossed that big divide fall into three categories. One 
is people who've changed professional jobs. We had somebody at the American Iron Steel Institute, AISI, who went to the American Institute for International Steel, AIIS, which put him on the opposite side of the chasm, but we had no trouble refuting his arguments because we just used his old papers against him. <laughs> uh, industrial people who have been, had their products brought into play or had their ox dragged into the ditch, that goes downstream and upstream. There's a lot of steel users, people who bend steel or, or otherwise form it into their products, who have always been opposed to steel dumping in subsidy cases because it raises the price of their inputs. But now they're filing their own cases because China has lowered some of its uh, targets into the downstream markets. Similarly, we had a steel uh, exec one time who had just joined AISI who called up in a fit of anger because the ferro alloy industry had filed a trade case. And this was going to raise the price of his inputs, and what were we going to do to kill it? So you find that where you stand in the chain of the movement of that product from raw material into the consumer's hands has a lot to do with what you, how, you see the, um, how you see the trade laws. And finally, there are elected politicians who have been known to change their mind on the trade laws, usually in response to political forces in their constituency. Now, if anyone today changes their mind from the other side to my side, I'll buy you a real lunch. Okay, the second point I want to make is that strict enforcement of, this, of strong trade laws has a disproportionate impact on popular support for trade liberaliz liberalization. It is true that the specifics of certain cases fly beneath the radar screen, but don't for a minute think that the people don't have a sense of whether they're being cheated out of their jobs and whether the government's doing anything about it. There's been a lot of talk since the election that, well, the job loss is due to um, uh, uh, downsizing of the economy or productivity gains or, or the people just don't realize how much they benefit from liberalized trade, and all that is absolutely true. But it would be a mistake to underestimate the impact of the knowledge that there's unfair trade in the market and that it hasn't been adequately addressed. There's a group called the Alliance for American Manufacturing, which uh, I've been involved in. They conduct polling every year on public attitudes about manufacturing. And they've been doing this long before the last election. Every year, uniformly, there is a supermajority of Americans answering that survey that's saying, yes, they believe some trade is unfair. Yes, they believe the government ought to be doing something about it. Yes, they will vote for a politician who feels that way about it. And yes, they will vote for a against a politician who doesn't feel that way about it. And so, you know, these polls have been shared with political campaigns every year, especially in presidential years. But this past year, both major candidates finally read them and embraced them. And there was a bidding war on trade enforcement that we've been trying to instigate for decades. Uh, the fact is, one of the candidates read the gut and, and exploited it a little better than the other, and here we are. The third point is that besides popular support, there is pronounced political support, and here we are under the auspices of an academic institution, so I'm gonna go ahead and say it, arguing whether, tra whether um, remedy laws are protectionist or not, is almost an academic exercise and certainly will be for the next two or three years. Uh, the fact is that uh, the Congress, even long before this election, the Congress has repeatedly uh, made clear that it is the congressional intent that these laws be kept strong and strictly enforced. And I can, I've got five examples right here, maybe I can get into later if time permits, but let me just give you one. Five years ago, a federal judge said that the Commerce Department had never really truly been authorized by Congress to bring anti-subsidy cases against a non-market economy, China. And um, he said, well, you know, if, if, if the Congress meant to do that, then they should pass a law. Two months later, at the beginning of 2012, which was the election year for President Obama's re-election, totally partisan environment, that law passed, unanimous consent in the Senate, Suspension in the House, 10 to 1 ratio, 370 to 39, but who's counting? So, uh, you know, and it makes sense that members of Congress 
uh, would would uh, feel that way about the trade laws. Uh, they didn't want the trade laws undermined in the Doha round. They've passed recent legislation that beefs up the uh, energy test and cu customs ability to police up uh, fraud and circumvention. And just the other day, the House Appropriations Committee embraced the uh, Secretary Ross's in request for more money for enforcement and compliance, $5 million more, and um, unbidden, uh, made the following, uh, added the following language in their report. The committee instructs the ITA at Commerce to make the enforcement of anti-dumping and countervailing duty the highest priority and recommends that the ITA focus specifically on expeditiously reducing case, law, ba case backlogs and thoroughly investigating the extent to which trade law evasion harms domestic industries. I've added the emphasis. Uh, so, uh, I'll leave it at that, but, but uh, substantively, from a popular support point of view and a political support point of view, uh, we're in an era in which you can expect uh, aggressive ADCVD prosecution, either self-initiated or not, and um, I think we better find a way to understand how that contributes to popular support for free trade. It ran out of support in the last year, and it got to earn it back. Thank you. Okay. Bill? Bill Reich. Thank you, Bob. It's a real honor to be uh, back here on the Hill. It's been a while. <laughs> I'm going to deal with the question of whether the remedies correct unfair practices and alter foreigners' behavior that we don't like. And I'm going to do that by trying to talk about uh, economic effects, political effects, and behavioral effects, which kind of overlap, but uh, that's the division that I saw. I think on the economic side, uh, using the term correction may be asking too much. Uh, as I think Chad noted, uh, and I'm talking primarily about ADCVD here, but I'll uh, allude to some of the others later. Um, they are authorized by GATT WTO rules, uh, and the justification for them has uh, always been that their purpose is to offset the impact of the unfair act. So the duties are imposed to the extent of the dumping or subsidization that is found, and also if injury is found. So you have to prove harm and you have to prove the, the, the crime, as it were. But the, uh, the consequence, the added tariff, is not a penalty as much as it is an offset. Now, there's a fairly abstruse academic argument that the amount of the uh, additional duty should only be that sufficient to offset the injury rather than sufficient to offset the dumping. But the rules permit offsetting the full amount of the dumping or subsidization, and that's what U.S. law provides for. Do they work? Uh, first, I think that depends upon what you mean by work, um, because as an offset, they have limitations. They're intended to offset the crime. They're not intended to save the industry, to restore it to its former glory, or to solve all its problems. That might happen, but that would be a happy side effect. It's not really the purpose of, of, uh, of these provisions, despite what some people will say uh, about their intention in filing cases. Uh, the more important thing to say about whether or not they work is something that, that Tom alluded to, is they don't work if they're circumvented. And that makes enforcement a very large part of this issue. There's a lot of ways to circumvent anti-dumping uh, or countervailing duty orders. Some of them are illegal under most countries' domestic laws because they involve fraud, uh, like mislabeling or lying about the contents of a, of a container or something like that. Uh, other things like shipping the goods to a third country and relabeling them as having originated in that country uh, is a popular act activity, particularly in steel, as well as uh, making changes in a product in, in a second country in order to reclassify it as something that's not covered by the order, uh, and then uh, shipping it in the United States. So there's a lot of ways to get around them, and uh, if you have good enforcement, and the last several administrations uh, certainly the last one and clearly this one and, and uh, have, are determined to put a lot of resources into more enforcement, uh, you can probably have a, um, a much greater likelihood of them actually achieving their objective. When they work, um, I mean, I, I guess it's that, the, the next question is you have to kind of say, what does work mean? I think that there's occasionally people talk about working in terms of they're affecting the, amount, the number of imports or the effect on market share and things like that, all of which is relevant. But uh, I think, um, to me, the more important indication is do they produce a price effect? Uh, because that's the point. Uh, 
the purpose of adding a tariff is to raise the price of the imported product, uh, to get it out of the dumped range and presumably to make it uh, put it at a level at which the domestic product uh, can compete. Uh, now, back in the dark ages, in fact, when I started doing this, which was the 80s, uh, the biggest argument against these, uh, these acts uh, or these uh, orders was uh, that they were inflationary that they would increase the price of, as, as Tom was saying, downstream products. And your cars, your toasters, your, if, if we're talking about steel, your tar, cars, your toasters, your ovens, your refrigerators would all become more expensive. I can tell you a joke about that involving Georgetown, but I, in the interest of time, I'll, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip it. Um, we don't worry quite so much about inflation now, so the, although it's still an issue, but the, the point of the argument is a little bit different. But you want, ideally, if you're the petitioner, the domestic party bringing the case, uh, you want to see a price effect. Uh, that might or might not happen in, in the real world. Uh, the domestic seller might choose to eat all or part of the tariff because, by reducing its price uh, and simply making less money in order to stay competitive. Uh, second, you know, consumer pri preferences might be based on issues other than price, uh, so the import might be re mean, uh, remain attractive even if it's more expensive. Uh, one thing that means, at least to me, is that these remedies tend to work best in the case of fairly fungible products, where there's not a lot of product differentiation and price is the main determinant of the sale. Uh, that makes steel, actually, an exceptionally good uh, case for uh, this kind of thing. Complex products that are sold directly to consumers, like automobiles, uh, might not uh, respond, to the, the pricing might not respond, the market might not respond exactly the same way. Uh, the size of the added tariff <coughs> also matters in the real world. <coughs> For example, if avocados are a dollar each, I don't know if anybody's accused the Mexicans of avocado dumping, we'll, we'll see. But if avocados are a dollar each, uh, a 10% dumping margin would make them a dollar 10 each. Now, I mean, Chad might know something about the price elasticity of avocados, but uh, I don't. But I, my suspicion is that raising the price from a dollar to a dollar 10 is not going to make a huge mar uh, difference in the market, particularly if the domestic uh, producers actually take advantage of the increased uh, tariff and raise their prices as well, maybe only to a dollar five uh, or a dollar eight, but the, the margin stays smaller. <coughs> so real world effect is a little bit harder to uh, to predict, I think, than uh, academic uh, world effect. <coughs> now I should say in passing that <coughs> the ADCBD laws are not the only uh, import relief measures for unfair trade practices. Uh, there's also Section 301, uh, which you may be hearing more about. Uh, as time unfolds, there was a, um, an article this morning in Inside U.S. Trade, I believe, that uh, got into this in, in, in some detail as a potential alternative uh, steel course of action. That gives the President authority to take action against unfair, unreasonable, or discriminatory trade practices by their countries. It's a less mechanical law than ADCVD in the sense that there's not an adjudicatory quasi-judicial process. Uh, the President has wide uh, latitude to try to persuade the offending country to change its practice. It is different in the sense that it is not really designed to offset the practice. It is designed to impose a penalty that will persuade the other country to change its practice. Uh, this was a widely used statute in the 80s. The, the, Uruguay, the Uruguay round kind of put it out of business by uh, establishing a dispute settlement mechanism that, that made all of these things vulnerable to WTO litigation. So it's not been much used since then, but in its day, uh, it was useful uh, largely, uh, and this is something that why it might appeal to the current president, uh, initiating the investigation was an enormous piece of leverage because you announce that you've been identified, pick a country, China, as engaging in this unfair practice and you're going to investigate, and if you determine that that in fact has happened, uh, then you're going to take some action. That usually starts uh, a negotiation and a, a negotiation that usually ends in some accommodation by the allegedly offending country. So uh, it's a process that has its limitations, which I won't get into right now, but you may be seeing more about it. As was also mentioned, you've got 232s that I'll come back to in a minute. You've also got 201s, which are not designed to deal with unfair practices, but trying to design to deal with uh, a surge and to give an in the industry time to adjust to the surge. Um, all of these things have have mixed records, and we can talk about that. In terms of political effects, uh, these laws are widely viewed, and you all would know this as well as I do, providing a, politically, a political safety valve. Uh, 
because there's something that legislators can point to to deflect protectionist pressures from their constituents. That way, uh, your congressman doesn't have to sponsor a bill for protection, or he doesn't have to explain why he won't. Uh, he can go to his, ex his constituents and point to the administrative process. File a dumping petition. That will address your problem. And you say, tell them the complaining party should use that first. That allows legislators to make legislation the path of last resort rather than the path of first resort and gets this thing off the table in the Congress, which, trust me, is what a lot, a lot of legislators have wanted to do over the years. Finally, uh, behavioral effects. Uh, it's hard to make the case that trade remedies by themselves alter, all, alter another country's behavior, um, even if the remedy imposes a significant economic cost. The offending action was usually taken for domestic political reasons at home. And the government is often willing to pay a price for that. Um, it doesn't mean there's no hope. Uh, Steel is a good example. Uh, the many ADCVD cases filed against China have reduced Chinese steel imports into the U.S., but they've also pushed them into other countries, which in turn have passed them on to us uh, via circumvention or, or further processing. So the remedy solved a problem but contributed another one and didn't address the central issue, which is often the case in these things, which is overcapacity. Uh, and that's why we're talking about a 232, uh, and I won't, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the question of the viability of 232. We can discuss that later. I do have views about that. Uh, I would just say that the right answer here, putting aside all practicality, the right answer is probably a multilateral agreement on overcapacity. And uh, I think the, the, the Hamburg uh, G20 meeting got it right. Let's give some uh, relevance to the global forum on exactly that subject. Let's give them some deadlines. Let's see if they can bruise some solutions. Um, unfortunately for the president, this is a process that, because it's multilateral, spins out over time. In the end, it's the right answer, and it's the easiest answer, because if it's a multilateral process, everybody can say they're not the target, that everybody's the target. So it's not for the Chinese part of the American plot to encircle and destroy them. It's part of a multilateral problem. And they can say to their constituency at the end, everybody's taking a hit because everybody's making concessions. They're probably making more than anybody else, but they can ignore that. So it, I think it's also a more feasible remedy. And with that, I'll stop. Great. Uh, Steve, it's your turn. Sure, we'll thanks. Turn to Nelson. Great. Thank you very and, much, Bill. Um, it's also good to be back on the Hill after only been gone for for five months, wasn't yeah, that long? Yeah, stranger. Yeah, I know. I was, found, found, my way, found my way around uh, quite well. Um, and also, just to clarify, I'm speaking on my own behalf, not on the behalf of uh, any of uh, Wally Ryan's clients. Um, so, you know, the one thing about uh, coming after a number of speakers who have already gone into depth on the issues is, you know, what do you talk about? Um, so I want to hit a few things, you know, hopefully rather quickly. First is to answer Bob's question at the beginning of, you know, are trade remedy laws, are they a remedy, or are they uh, protection, uh, protectionist? And in, in a true lawyer fas fashion, I'll say it depends, because any law can be applied in an unfair way, an improper way, be it an environmental law, criminal law, tax laws. So, you know, whether one makes a, a judgment on how the trade remedy laws are being applied, um, does that mean that the laws in and of themselves are a bad thing? Or are they in and of themselves uh, protectionists? And I would, I would say no, in and of themselves, um, they do, they are there to remedy um, um, trade, types of trade that, you know, for a long time, um, not only the United States, but many other countries have viewed to be, to be detrimental, to be, to be unfair. And again, these laws go back to, way back to right before and after World War I. Actually, our friends, the Canadians, were the first to have an anti-dumping duty law. The U.S. law is, the, is based on the Trade Act of 1930. Okay, so this is not, you know, this is not anything new. Um, we've had anti-dumping and countervailing duty laws for a long time because it has been recognized that, that economic circumstances can, can occur that you need to have some type of remedy. And, you know, as far as dumping goes, you know, selling a product in, 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 the, in the U.S. at an unfairly low price – 
possibly because a country has, is, has overcapacity, because of other things, um, you know, essentially exporting its unemployment. Um, there is a need to, re to respond to that, to remedy it. On account of alien duty laws, you're remedying subsidies. Is it fair for a U.S. company to have to, sub have to compete essentially against a foreign government who is providing either you know, free electricity, free capital, and other, other support to its, its foreign competitor? Um, again, the purpose of the remedy is to, is to offset these. So there are deep policy reasons for having these laws. As Bill touched on, there are deep poli political reasons for having these laws. That, you know, and as also Tom pointed out, there is wide support in Congress um, for, for the unfair trade laws. And, you know, why is it there? I think, you know, m most members see the, va the policy value of it. But frankly, there's a political value of it, too. And it has the, the unfair trade laws have allowed other you know, nominally pro-trade uh, types of legislation to go through. Most recently, um, when Trade Promotion Authority was uh, reauthorized, there is also a, uh, another set of uh, laws that amended the uh, anti-dumping duty laws that came along with it, which created the political space for some members to also support TPA. Now, those who are in the, you know, put themselves in the, in the free trade camps, says, well, that, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't have to do that. You shouldn't have to pay off people to support free trade. Um, I, in my own view, I think you have to flip it onto the free trade camp is if you guys did a better job in promoting free trade, you wouldn't have to do it. You know, if you start off every argument for free trade by quoting a Scottish guy who died 200 years ago and cloth and wine, it, you've already lost 95% of your, your, your audience in uh, 2017. Um, so, well, you might not, it, it's amazing how much that's, that's still done. So it, there is a very important political aspect to it too. Um, well, real quickly, right, you know, some of the more recent um, aspects of how these laws have been applied, you know, particularly as, as Ch uh, Chad brought them up, I think, or, or bear thinking about, um, are these inherently anti-China? Yes, there has been an increase of cases against China. There's also been a decrease in cases against Japan, South Korea, and other Asian, other countries. What's happened? Well, production and exports to the U.S. have shifted from those countries to China. So as the volume of, of, of exports from China to the U.S. have increased, the you know, potentialities of, of uh, trade frictions and of these types of problems coming up will also increase. So I think it's kind of a natural aspect of, of the fact that increased trade with China would be accompanied with an inc increased number of these types of uh, cases against Chinese, Chinese inputs. Um, another thing to keep in mind is now how much are the number of these cases or the nature of these cases really a reflection of any given administration's trade policies or its own initiatives? And I would say not very much because a lot of these, you know, not a lot, almost 99% you know, of these cases, particularly in the U.S., are brought by companies, not by the government, not by the administration. It's not the administration who decided to bring a case against lumber, which actually started under the previous administration. It was not the administration's decision to bring a case against sugar from Mexico, which also occurred under the previous administration. Um, in fact, the lumber and the Mexican sugar cases are, are excellent examples of this because the Canadian lumber case, as some, some know, this is the fifth time we've had cases against Canadian lump, softwood lumber. There is an intrinsic uh, policy problem between the U.S. and Canada on softwood lumber that goes back beyond the 1980s when the first case was brought, I and mean, some have shown it goes back to the 1880s and there's a brief border war over it. Um, so these are not new issues. The same thing with sugar from Mexico. What happened recently with sugar from Mexico is there was an agreement. The sugar industry was already finding problems how the, the agreement was being um, enforced on the Mexican side long before President Trump was, was elected. Um, so again, does this really reflect a you know Trump administration initiative, um, not really. So you know the main thing to keep in mind, uh, I think, as you look at what's going on, is to separate the rhetoric from the reality. Um, true, this administration talks about trade in a different way than past administrations, and and uses kind of different words. But the reality of the fact is there's really not that much difference. Um, when this administration said that 
well, gee, you know what? We don't have to follow WTO decisions. Every administration has said that, back to the Clinton administration, because the United States and any other WTO member does not have to follow every WTO decision. There are WTO decisions the United States has, been, has not been following for years, and yet the world still turns. There are, not, there are WTO decisions that other significant economies have, have not followed for years, and yet the trading system still exists. So I think it's important not to get hyperbolic about it, um, to you know, really try to see what's going on versus how it's being talked about. And uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. That's uh, very helpful and very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, Nelson? And although Steve and I did not plan this, his ending meshes perfectly with my beginning. Uh, I am pulling, I'm going to pull the lens back and try to give you my idea of what is actually going on with this administration's trade policy to put a context around the question of the specific issue of protectionism and the specific issue of trade remedies. Uh, and uh, Steve, I see it differently than you do. I think this administration is deadly serious about what, about changing the way that we deal with trade, uh, about changing the way that we deal with our trading partners. And the evidence, I would argue, out there is manifest in their words and is beginning to be manifest in their actions. I want to start with a, a document that I really think all of you should go take a look at. It's an op-ed that H.R. McMaster and Gary Cohn did in the Wall Street Journal May 31st, uh, right after the President returned from his first trip to Europe. It is entitled, and it, if you're going to lay out, if you're going to think it's a little early to talk about a Trump doctrine, read this op-ed, because I think it actually lays out the Trump doctrine in a way that is very specifically relevant to trade. It's entitled, America First Doesn't Mean America Alone. It says, while meeting with European leaders, the President reiterated his concern that our trade def about our trade deficits with many European nations. Simply put, America will treat others as they treat us. And they lay out the President's organizing vision. They said, the President had a, quote, clear-eyed outlook that the world is not a global community, but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businesses engage and compete for advantage. So he does not approach even discussions with allies as community discussions, but rather than as being part of an arena where we are competing. And then they go on. We, the United States, bring to this forum unmatched military, political, economic, cultural, and moral strength. Rather than deny this elemental nature of international affairs, we embrace it. So the world is an arena. We're the biggest guy in the arena and we're going to use every bit of our force for our advantage. That is a very different view of the United States and its role in the world than we've seen since the end of World War II. Now, how does this apply to trade? Well, the President has said clearly over and over and over again that he wishes to undo the unfair trade deficits that he believes exist, have existed against the United States for decades. He has said this during the campaign. He said it repeatedly uh, during his presidency. He's tweeted about it. Germany is very, very bad for, sending, for having an $80 billion trade deficit with us. And he similarly talked about trade deficits with Mexico, with China, and others. Uh, the response I hear from some is, well, and this is Steve's point, look at the actions, not the words. You know, sometimes with this president, he changes his mind. He says different things at different times. He can embrace different arguments. I would argue on trade. I've looked at his thinking on these issues for many, many years. And on trade and a related issue, he has been remarkably consistent. Trade and immigration, I would argue, are the two steel rods that go through his thinking for decades. Immigration is ruining our country and ruining our country's character. And trade is, uh, is hollowing us out, and we are the victims of unfair trade practices and sharp practices 
by our trading partners. We've heard that from him over and over and over again. And how does he measure this? He measures it very simply in bilateral trade deficits. There are economists at this table. There are probably economists in this room. Every economist I've talked to said that's not the way you measure really imbalances. Bilateral trade deficits reflect certain factors. They often reflect differences in saving pat savings patterns between the countries. But you should not look at bilateral trade practices as being uh, indicia of unfair actions or of problems in a relationship. Nevertheless, the President keeps on coming back to this. Now, okay, he talks about it. Is he acting on this? And I would argue the evidence is now becoming very clear. Uh, we're here in the dog days of August, uh, a time when in Washington usually not much, do not much gets done. The fact that this room is full on a Friday uh, with Hill staffers and others indicates that the dog days of July are actually quite a busy period. Just this week, and perhaps next week, we're seeing four things that I would argue are going to help us understand where the President really stands on trade issues. One has already occurred, two have already occurred, and two may come out in coming days. Uh, the first that occurred is the meeting with the Chinese counterparts with, Vice Premier, with the Vice Premier of China in the China SED. Everybody who knows anything, everybody who follows this has told me it's a disaster. Uh, even as the meeting started, they each side canceled the normal press conference that they deliver at the end where they talk about the progress that's been made. There's been very little said about the meetings, but the hallway chatter is that the bilateral discussions, which were meant to discuss trade. Remember, uh, Trump and Xi met at Mar-a-Lago. They had cake. They set a 100-day uh, schedule to address these issues. Well, here we are, and the talks ended in failure. Number one. N uh, number two, the 232 steel decision, which is we're all waiting for it imminently, and we've heard about this. Any day now, this will come out, and many of us suspect it's going to impose uh, uh, penalties on many of our trading partners, even those that many would argue uh, are allies and not possible opponents in any sort of a military conflict. The third is a deficit report, which was commissioned, which is meant to look at the bilateral trade deficits the U.S. has with trading partners around the world. Again, we've been waiting for this for weeks. We don't know when it will come out. The suspicion is it will come out maybe today, maybe next week. And this will be, I would argue, the target list that the President will use to decide what countries to go after with trade deficit numbers that he feels his administration can support and go behind. And the fourth thing, and I want to turn to this now and spend a little time on it, are the NAFTA objectives, which were mentioned, which came out on Monday. This starts a 30-day clock. This is the administration's objectives for the coming negotiations. Congress now has 30 days to comment. Actually, you now have 26 days to comment. Uh, the, the clock is ticking. And in this report, which will start a historic renegotiation, uh, of an agreement that most would argue has worked quite well, the President said, two th the President's team said two things that I think are worth quoting. The very first objective in this 17-page report, number one, improve the U.S. trade balance and reduce the trade deficit with the NAFTA countries. Now, there's a very small trade deficit with Canada, and if you include services, uh, you include uh, there's a services surplus and there's a goods deficit. It's kind of a wash. With Mexico, there's a $60 billion trade deficit. That is true. But number one objective, to reduce the trade deficit with the NAFTA countries. In the introduction, which explains sort of more the theory of what, where they're going, it says, quote, the new NAFTA will be modernized to reflect 21st century standards and will reflect a fairer deal addressing America's persistent trade imbalances in North America. So we see the President has told his team, these are your marching orders, number one, to reduce that trade deficit. Well, how, do you, how are you going to reduce a $60 billion trade deficit with Mexico? This is a smart group of people, and they may have a better answer than I have. 
I see three ways that you can adjust a bilateral trade deficit. One is tariffs, one is quotas, one is managed trade. If those are put on the table, I don't see how either of our trading partners are, are going to continue. Um, I look at the, the impending NAFTA negotiations, and I see some very rough sledding coming up. Uh, it's going to be difficult to align the President's objectives, particularly that of removing, shifting $60 billion. You take $60 billion out of the Mexican economy, that is hugely significant. The lost my train of thought, pardon me. Um, as these discussions go forward, we're also going to have the overhang of the other steel rod in President Trump's thinking on these issues, and that is immigration. And if anyone thinks that the wall and who will pay for the wall and immigration practices in general will not be overhanging the NAFTA discussions, I don't think you understand dynamics in Mexico and you don't understand dynamics here in the American Southwest. So let me, let me bring this now to a conclusion. Uh, before I do that, let me note, those of you who work for members here on the Hill, you have 26 more days for your members to give their views on those NAFTA objectives. I know, I know the committees of jurisdiction are looking at this. They may have something. But all of you out there may have, may have comments to make, and this is the time to make it. If you want to shape these discussions, this is the very time to do it here in the dog days of July. I think we're beginning to see a very clear pattern in this administration of how they're going to treat trade. President Trump believes he was elected to upend the regime on trade. He was, believes he was elected to upend the status quo on immigration. And I think he is deadly serious about both of those, and his team uh, is deadly serious about both of those. So when we look at the McMaster and Cohn op-ed, if the NAFTA negotiations are an arena, then we will bring to that forum our unmatched military, political, economic, cultural, and moral strength. And Canada and Mexico, I guess you better bring yours. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, uh, very trenchant. Uh, Steve, do you disagree with Nelson? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I'm not here to say I, I mean, I agree with everything that, that's, that's in that op-ed of the, that was a very, I'm glad you brought it up because that, 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 that was an important kind of statement from the administration and, on its view of the world. Um, but, and again, as I said, yes, the administration and the president is talking about trade in a, in, the, in a different way. But the themes of the problems of, or the perceived problems of unfair trade um, the focus on the importance of the trade deficit, um, NAFTA not working, are not new. I mean, candidate Barack Obama went after Na NAFTA in 2008. Um, I, you know, could very easily get a lot of floor statements from a lot of members of Congress on both sides focusing on, on the trade deficit for better or for worse. And I think, you know, you can't have a very good argument on, you know, what are the causes of trade deficits um, you know, excellent uh, expose a couple of weeks ago in The Economist about the about Germany's trade uh, surplus to the rest of the world and why does it have it? And it's not really because of currency or unfair trade. It's other other you know they don't you know they save more, they consume less. We we consume more, we save less. Um, there's a lot of a lot of that is is part of it. But these aren't new. These aren't new themes. These are, you know, they've been out there for a long time, and I kind of find it, you know, ironic and, and, and funny that, you know, a lot of the people who are now saying, oh, my gosh, I can't believe, you know, President Trump is saying these things. Well, he's just saying things that others have been saying for a very long time. Mm. And, but, you know, he, and so the seeds for, you know, what, what we're seeing today have been planted by others 
who sued them over the past several years, several decades, going after NAFTA, talking, you know, complaining about trade deficits, saying that, you know, prefacing that any kind of trade, there has to be a, you know, there, there's an element of unfairness to it. And now we're just seeing the results of, of, of those several decades of, uh, of, uh, of statements. If I may, Bob, I think that exactly makes my point, because we're now we're seeing actions. Obama right. might have made an offhand comment about renegotiating NAFTA during a primary debate in Ohio, but he did not send a notice of NAFTA renegotiating objectives to the Congress in order to bring the other two parties to the table. Yeah, I, think that's the, I think that's a very good point. Never in my experience since 1962 with trade negotiations have I seen such a determined barrage, maybe during uh, Vance Hartke, I mean, Hart Burke Hartke, that's a long time ago, but this is a really pronounced um, campaign backed by repeated remarks, by rhetoric, by, by, Ross, by Secretary Ross. Um, this is serious. This isn't just campaign stuff. So I think, I mean, I'm interjecting as a moderator, but I have to, uh, I certainly have to side with Nelson. So let's turn to the uh, audience. Um, <laughs> get, off, get off the hot seat here. Uh, <laughs> you can come back, Steve. You can come back. You have more time. Anybody have a comment? Right here is uh, Joanne. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, this is on? Yes. It is. Um, I'm Joanne Thornton with Policy Connections International and the Global Business Dialogue. And uh, thank you all. Um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the arena that, um, that Nelson mentioned uh, in the context of negotiation as well as, well, what, what other countries may or may not be doing with respect to trade remedy law, whether it's in response to our trends or not. Um, so, for example, in the, in the NAFTA objectives, uh, it seemed like there were some pretty important departures, uh, some, some strengthening of the remedy laws beyond getting rid of Chapter 19 and uh, the uh, safeguard exception. <coughs> um, third country dumping, I'm thinking about, uh, which was mentioned in that Wall Street Journal article. Uh, at the WTO, the Chinese have made proposals that I gather are completely unacceptable to the U.S., but um, is there a prospect of a, a fruitful discussion about trade remedy rules uh, at the WTO? Uh, the, the EU is implementing um, some reforms in its remedy laws. So if anyone cares to address what's going on uh, in the arena, uh, that will either be detrimental or helpful to us, that would be great. John? So I, I think it's a great question. I would, I would step back from it, though, and try to reiterate that thinking about it through the lens of, of trade remedies is really the reaction, right? And so what we really need to think about is what the underlying problem is that we're trying to address. And the underlying problem that we're trying to address arguably right now is this stems back to dealing with China. And China is a different economic system than what we have in the United States. And in the case of the special case of steel and aluminum, right? these are special cases. Steel, we see these episodes of overcapacity time and time again. Now it's China. You know, 12 years, 15 years ago, when in 2002 it wasn't China, it was the, the collapse of Asia, Asian financial crisis and contagion, but we had to deal with it then. We had to deal with the recession of 91, 92. But today, it's China grew tremendously, 10 to 12 percent every year. It needed lots and lots of steel. It built up this capacity. Its growth has slowed down. It doesn't need that steel anymore. So it faces a choice. Does that wind that steel back? Does it close down plants? Does it lay off workers in manufacturing and in steel production like we have done in the United States? Or does it try to export some of that and not have to shut things down? And that is the problem, the issue that has to be addressed. Trade remedies aren't going to get us to a solution. We've already used trade remedies in the United States to stop the imports from China, and arguably that's what's tied our hands right now. We have very little unilateral leverage to deal with China because we've already stopped the imports from coming in from China. So now we have to deal with the fact that these steel exports from China are going to other countries, they're getting transformed into other, or other countries can just simply send us their steel instead because they can use the Chinese steel. We have to stop thinking about it, in my mind, through the lens of trade remedies and figure out a way to, to target the underlying problem. And there, I think, what came out of the G20 was 
potentially a solution, right? This, this OECD forum on overcapacity mm -hmm. uh, and getting countries to the table and actually dealing with the underlying source of the concern here. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Reich, comment. Yeah, good question, Joanne. I, I, my only comment would be that the politics have, of this have changed, although uh, the economics have changed. I'm not sure the politics have caught up with it. But one of the interesting things in the last, say, 20 years has been sort of the internationalization of these remedies. For a long time, it was the U.S. and a few European countries. Now, you know, the Indians file dozens of these things. Uh, so do the Chinese, actually. Everybody has their own law. And the countries that have been a target, the Japanese, who were targets forever, uh, mostly by Americans, they have their own law. And the, these countries have learned how to use those laws uh, prosecutorially in the same way that we have, so that you've got everybody out there playing the, this game where you used to have a, a, you know, a group of people who felt like victims and a group of people who felt like they were aggrieved uh, plaintiffs. And now you have everybody as both. And in a world of global supply chains, you have a much more complex domestic political dynamic in every country. Uh, when I was at the NFTC, I asked one of my members when this stuff was on the table, well, what do you think about you know, dumping rules? And he said, well, look, you know, my company is a, we're, we're a petitioner in one case, we're a respondent in another, uh, and we buy input products that are subject to an anti-dumping duty order. You tell me what our position is. And company after company after company is finding themselves in that position. What has not happened yet in the WTO, uh, which I don't quite understand, is that the politics hasn't caught up with that reality. A number of countries, particularly the Japanese, who are worse than the Chinese on this, you know, are determined to um, gut these laws, basically, and, and uh, render them uh, harmless because they perceive themselves only as victims and not as beneficiaries. If you look at what's actually happening in the economy, that's not true, but they continue to maintain the same position they've had for years. Um, I don't see any near-term solution to this. I, mean, I, I wouldn't say the United States is opposed to everything the Chinese have, have offered. The, China, the United States has refused to negotiate on the grounds that the mandate for doing that has expired. Um, everybody else is opposed uh, and has said so. Uh, so I, I don't think they've got a bright future, and I don't see a near-term outcome. But eventually, because of the universality of the remedy, I think the politics will catch up with that, and it may be easier to come to some conclusions that will produce you know, some modest changes. We have another question? Oh, wait, Tom? Let me, let me just uh, agree that dumping cases, subsidy cases, et cetera, are treating a symptom and not a cause. Um, it is, and especially in the steel industry, it is the persistent overcapacity. I don't, uh, I don't uh, agree to the Chinese argument that they merely overbuilt and miscalculated what they would need for their own, uh, their 12-year plans, or their five-year plans that have come out in sequence have frequently talked about going abroad uh, they clearly intend to dominate uh, global steel production. It's, it's far beyond what they would ever need. But, uh, and they've also become e excellent at uh, avoiding uh, enforceable commitments about overcapacity. They are master rope-a-dopers. Uh, I mean, I was involved in U.S. Steel-China dialogues many years ago. There was a whole series of SNEDs. Uh, under Paulson and Clinton, there was JCCT meetings, et cetera, all of which had overcapacity on the agenda, none of which resulted in anything enforceable. And I must say, although I'm sorry for all the other industries and service organizations that wanted to get something out of the uh, current CED, Comprehensive Economic Dialogue, I don't consider what happened in Washington this week a disaster because for the very first time, the U.S. basically said, this is on the agenda, this is at the top of the agenda, and we're not going to start agreeing to a whole bunch of stuff and then go back and tell our industry, well, we raised it. Mm -hmm. You know, this was an important moment, and it wasn't, we don't know what happened in that room. There were no press conferences or haven't been really any really good readouts or something about race I read, but the fact is many industries are now very upset with the way it came out, but that's not a bad thing because heretofore many industries have gotten what they've wanted and the steel industry has been upset. So it's kind of a reversal of fortunes here and, a, and creating a little bit of leverage. I also don't believe that we have no, no uh, unilateral leverage left. Okay, um, there was a question right here. Let's go. Here it is. <laughs> 
Thank I'm, you very much, I'm, Ben. Yeah, I'm Bob Feinberg from American University. Uh, to some extent, this holds with anti-dumping and CDD cases, but it seems to me even more so with the 201s and the 232s and Buy America programs, but there doesn't seem to be any discussion at all of retaliation, um, precedent that we're setting. I mean, if we say Buy American is great, then how do we react to Europe saying Buy European in terms of airplanes and such? Uh, so I, I'm just curious your reaction about you know, why retaliation effects on exporters, uh, U.S. exporters, seems to be totally ignored. Uh, so I think that's a great point, Bob. Um, we, we are, I think, starting to hear it in the media. Uh, and so, you know, we saw right before the G20 uh, reporting by the Financial Times that the Europeans have already drawn up their product list. If the 232, uh, the steel case, ultimately hits them, uh, they're going to go after uh, bourbon from Kentucky and, and dairy products from Wisconsin and, uh, and Florida orange juice, right? Uh, you know, similar strategies that has been pursued in the past. And I think what this administration has yet to sort of fully internalize is retaliation is actually much more strategic and can be more economically costly and politically costly uh, than the benefits of protection. Um, and and uh, until you, I think, have to, you see that working its way out in practice, you don't actually realize it. But I think we're, you know, the threats that are happening out there uh, are, I, I hope, hoping to crystallize what the potential costs of these actions would, would actually be before they're actually, the policy decisions are made to do them. Well said. Um, anybody else? Nelson, you want to comment? Uh, just a quick, again, 30,000 foot pulling the lens back. Uh, it's you know, President Trump's view of retaliation is you punch me, I'm going to punch you harder. And this has been his, this has been what he learned from Roy Cohn many years ago when Roy Cohn was his lawyer. Uh, you punch me, I'm going to punch you harder. So I think if American industry goes to him and says, oh, we're afraid of retaliation, we're afraid of, he's going to say, just you wait. Wait, let him retaliate, see what I do. Right here. I am. Uh, Dylan Carlson, ITC. Um, I was hoping maybe you guys could That's the International Trade Commission? That's right, yeah. Good, thanks. International Trade Commission. Uh, I was hoping you guys could speculate about uh, how you think self-initiation at commerce might work out? Uh, what problem is this addressing? What's driving this? And uh, do you see a major expansion in ADCBD cases in the next couple of years as a result of that? Thanks. I'll, I'll pick that up. Um, well, I mean, you, you know, you know, Secretary Ross has talked about self-initiating cases. Um, I think, although again, not the be repetitive, but the issue of self-initiation has been around for a while. You know, one, obviously, it's been in the law for a long time. Um, it has not been used very much, but over the past, I'd say, 10 years, it's been talked about more and more. Um, you know, the perception is that to bring a case requires such an outlay of, uh, of resources and time from a, an industry that is, you know, um, uh, assertively to be already injured and not doing well and in financial straits that, you know, the, the burden is too high to, you know, to be able to avail themselves of these laws and therefore the, uh, the, uh, the Department of Commerce should use its authority to self-initiate. Um, so that's the idea. You know, obviously no cases have been self-initiated yet. And I, I, that kind of gets to my point too is, again, you got to look at where the rhetoric when the one it meets meets reality. Uh, at the end, there's a lot of talk about action, but so far there hasn't been any. Okay. And um, so, about you know, there there there's rumors that commerce is 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 open to the idea. But as you know, um, even if I, I think I, I mean I will say that companies industries who who think that this is a panacea will be sorely disappointed because they're still going to have to. Uh, go to the International Trade Commission and show to the International Trade Commission that um, the imports not only are, are they um, unfairly priced or unfairly subsidized, but they're a cause of material 
injury or a threat of material injury, which is one thing I have to point out that we really haven't gone into is that, you know, you, you do need to ha make two showings, one that the that the imports are unfair, either by price or subsidization, but also that there is actual, there is a causal nexus between those imports mm -hmm. and the uh, domestic industry being uh, materially injured or threatened with material injury. So they're still going to have to um, expend those resources to be successful at the ITC. They're still going to expend resources to participate at the process of the Department of Commerce to, you know, comment on the information that's provided and things like that. So in my own personal view, you know, it might, it gets over what is already a fairly low statutory hump um, to get a case going at Commerce. Um, but after that, I don't think it's going to be any great, um, you know, savings of resources or time. Okay, there was a hand here, I think. Another question? Over here. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Trevor Guy. I'm with EOP. My question is for Mr. Cunningham. EOP. Sir, you described um, judging relationships with our trading partners based on bilateral um, surpluses or deficits. I'm curious, what other metrics would you use to judge a relationship with our trading partners? <laughs> I, as somebody who's worked on North American issues since the late 90s. Uh, I think our relationship with Mexico and Canada is so much broader than, bi than any bilateral trade deficit that to begin there and end there uh, is, is uh, terribly not only, not only dangerous, uh, but it's just not based on anything truly important. Look at our relationship with Europe. Uh, yes, we have a substantial deficit with Europe. Uh, they are selling goods to us, uh, what, $150 billion more a year than we sell to them. Uh, does, is that because they're taking advantage of us or just because they make machines and cars that we want to buy? Um, economists will tell you it's about savings versus investment. Uh, and if we here in this country saved, saved more, uh, invested more, spent less, that would take care of our trade deficit bilaterally with most of our trading partners. Um, I think for our trading, for any of them looking at us and say, well, why are you punishing us because you are a hyper-consuming nation? And I think that's a fair question. I'd just like to comment that I think it's brand new that we divide the world into the good and bad based upon whether we have a deficit or not. That, that's just contrary to any economist's appreciation of global, global commerce. You just don't say, okay, Mexico, France, et cetera, et cetera, country by country, they're bad because we, we have a deficit with them. It's just, to, to, it's very nearsighted and dangerous. So let's go ahead. Yeah. Bill. This is not a direct response, but one of the things that I found peculiar about this particular aspect of the debate is you know, if you're trying to reduce the number, there's only two ways to do that, uh, buy less or sell more. And one of the things that is odd about the current debate is the administration's focus has been 98 percent on buy less. Uh, and what seems to be missing in all this is export promotion. And it's, it, it astonished me, I mean, it's missing because politically it's the easiest thing to do. You know, the last three or four presidents have all come in with a grand export promotion plan. You know, it's the Secretary of Commerce climbing aboard Air Force, whatever number it is, with a bunch of CEOs leading trade missions off, signing deals, and coming back and say, we just increased, you know, exports by $80 billion. Uh, I mean, this is not rocket science. Everybody has done this. I worked for Ron Brown and watched him do it. Uh, and, and, you know, all of his successors have done it too. Yet this administration have missed, has missed that boat entirely. They don't talk about trade uh, promotion. They don't talk about export promotion. Uh, their budget proposals would decimate the people in the government that do that. Uh, and they focus only on the other half of the equation, which is by far the harder part of the equation to meet, which is uh, buying less. Uh, as, as a former chair of the advisory committee at the Exim Bank, uh, I think I can point to this administration's lack of support for the Exim Bank as exactly what you're pointing to. Th thank you very much. Rachel Pfeffer, Library of Congress. Um, many of you talked about 
the decision that came out of the G20 summit in terms of endorsing the OECD forum um, on steel overcapacity. So I was curious kind of what sort of solutions could they actually come up with? What sort of enforcement could there be? And do you think it could be a precedent for how we deal with other issues such as aluminum? Well, I, I would merely uh, repeat what I said before, that, that China has been uh, very good at, at sliding off uh, either making commitments or, or fulfilling commitments. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the CED may be a, may be a little hint of, of how to do it, and that is, you know, unless you create a new cause of action that, that you can bring a, a case uh, in the WTO on mere overcapacity, uh, uh, or maybe you pump up uh, the, the trade laws so that it's easier to win a higher margin, but, but they're pretty high on China already, or, or you can take overcapacity into account. It just seems to me that it's a negotiation and that we just have to do what happened at the CED and then to just say this is what we're talking about. You know, when you uh, not only commit to take down a certain percentage of unnecessary capacity and stop building new stuff, which they keep doing, then we'll talk about all these other things that are on your agenda. I mean, it's a very tough and, and frustrating position to take. It's going to anger a lot of American uh, uh, industries, especially those ex interested in exporting to China. But up until now, nothing else has worked. I mean, that's, that's our leverage. Okay, that, talking about leverage, I'd like to uh, tell a little story. That is a conversation I was part of with a very senior new official at USDR who made the case that uh, we, were, we were fine, as things were great up until, let's say, the WTO uh, came into force and that meant dispute settlement. And gosh, things went bad. You know, the, the we started getting deficits and, and we were tr being treated unfairly. And now we're in this negative position where we have no leverage. We gave all of our leverage away in the WTO and the GATT particularly. In services, we cut our uh, restraints, but we and four other major players, but most of them did not. And that's true. They didn't. The, most of the develop, then developing world did not comply, did not go along in the schedule of commitments uh, to the extent that we did, the EU did, et cetera. So in a way, they're right. We've lost leverage in trade negotiations. So the argument this guy made, very senior guy, very seriously, is that we have to regain our leverage. How do we regain our leverage? We use trade restraints. We use remedies. One country at a time, however it works, whichever law applies, 232, 201, 301, uh, et cetera. Uh, go to Chad's database, you'll see. And um, we'll just do it one at a time, and we'll ramp up the ante so that we get leverage in negotiations. Whatever it takes to get that, we got to get it. That's what this guy said, very senior guy. And I, I, I believe it based upon what's happened since that was in May. Um, so if anybody disagrees with that, I'd like to hear it. I don't disagree with the uh, theory. The theory, okay. I, mean, the I don't disagree with the strategy. Oh, wow, okay. So I do disagree with the strategy. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think, again, I think it goes back to this issue of uh, there needs to be a long-term strategy to deal with the new kid on the block that's just fundamentally different, and that is China. Uh, the Obama administration had a strategy, uh, whether you liked it or not, and that was the TPP, right? It was writing down a new 21st century trade agreement that would have rules ultimately to deal with China down the road on state-owned enterprises, on digital trade, on labor, environment, anti-corruption, lots of lots of different issues. We haven't seen what the Trump administration's actual long-term plan to, to address the systemic issue that China is just a fundamentally different type of economy than we are. Uh, and so this could, you know, this could be uh, let's, let's retaliate, let's impose trade barriers, but I don't see what the end game is to this under that approach, unfortunately. Well, time has come to the end. If there is a closing comment by any, any member of the yeah. panel, let's, let's go for it. 
<laughs> Steve gets his turn. Go All for right, it. here's the dirty secret, and everyone else in the trade community is going to hate me for saying this, but you want to get rid of trade deficits? It's not trade policy that gets rid of trade deficits. It's tax policy, it's education right. policy, it's health care policy, it's labor policy. Those are the real things that are going to drive whether U.S. companies and U.S. workers are competitive globally, not trade policy. The very fact that the, and I don't bl blame them for doing this, the very fact that the retailers bought an ad on Saturday Night Live regarding tax policy but never bought an ad on Saturday Night Live regarding TPP, I think shows they recognize what actually drives their competitiveness and what, what affects them the most. So um, as much as we like to talk about trade policy, it's important, but it's not the most important thing as far as the competitiveness of our com companies and workers. Good Bipartisan agreement. Let's thank everybody and close the session.